Good afternoon. Thank you for attending our session today. My name is Naina Prasad, and I'm a senior technical program manager here with AWS AI. I'm here today to highlight the meaningful work being done by two recent Amazon Research Award recipients. I'll start this session today by giving a brief overview of the Amazon Research Awards program and our mission. Then, Professor Philip Resnick from the University of Maryland will speak on his research on NLP methods to more effectively identify and help people facing mental health illness, mental health issues. Following Professor Resnick, we'll have Professor John Tamir from the University of Texas in Austin talk about his work using deep learning models to reduce the scan time and improve the quality of MRIs. Time permitting, we'll end our session with a Q&A, so please hold your questions until the end. The Amazon Research Awards, or the ARA program, provides funding to researchers at academic institutions and nonprofits. We support the people leading the cutting edge of research across a wide variety of domains, such as artificial intelligence, robotics, and sustainability. At AWS, everything we do begins with real customers and real problems. With the ARA, we aim to support researchers who are also focused on improving the world around them at scale. The map behind me illustrates the global reach of the program, with the five most funded countries highlighted in blue. Since 2015, the ARA program has hosted between two and four call for proposal cycles annually. We've funded nearly 650 proposals from 199 institutions over 36 countries. Over the years, we've expanded to host CFPs in more than 25 different domains, including 13 specifically in the artificial intelligence and machine learning space. Our process begins with calls for proposals, giving researchers the opportunity to present their plans. From there, AWS scientists and scholars peer review the proposals we receive from the researchers seeking out those with notable potential. After the selection process, award recipients are granted unrestricted cash gift funding for their work and to sponsor their graduate students. We also provide AWS promotional credit to support the technical challenges of their research. After funding, we share and showcase the technical, scientific, and socially impactful contributions made by these awardees. Since the start of the ARA program, we have funded nearly $20 million in unrestricted cash gifts and over $10 million in AWS promotional credits. Today, we're joined by two researchers who used their awards to develop novel solutions using machine learning to, for real-world problems. By using ML, researchers are now able to process data at scale to find patterns and correlations previously too complex to identify through more traditional scientific and mathematical models. The two researchers speaking here today are leading improvements on how we can better manage mental health, physical health, and public health in the future. They have used machine learning to improve our abilities to care for each other by seeking increased accessibility, accuracy, and inclusivity of AI methods in healthcare. Professor Resnick is developing models powered by the words we think and how they reflect the thoughts that we think. Professor Tamir is working to improve access to a medical imaging technology that has traditionally been costly and time intensive. Please join me in welcoming Professor Philip Resnick. <laughs> Well, let me start by saying uh, thank you to all of you for being here, um, and thank you to AWS for the invitation to speak, and to ARA for supporting the research. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, I, I want to start by noting that stuff I'm going to be talking about is challenging. Mental health issues are a challenging thing. 
Um, and so it's always worth reminding people that if you or somebody you know are going through difficult times, there are resources to call upon, like the stuff that we have up on the slide, including things like the 988 helpline. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is actually work done in collaboration with my wife, Rebecca Resnick, who's a clinical psychologist. Um, and so I'm going to begin with some of what she has taught me about pain points from the clinician's perspective. One of the initial pain points to think about is the fact that most of the time, the problems don't surface with a mental health professional. They surface with primary care providers. And so here's a quote from a, from a New York Times article some months back talking about the fact that if somebody has a child and they need to see a psychiatrist, there can be, say, a month-long wait as compared to a primary care, which can be faster. Actually, Rebecca's response to this was, uh, yeah, you'd be lucky um, if, uh, if you could actually get uh, somebody uh, in within a month. Her practice uh, is, is booked out, I think, until March at this point. Um, so that's a first problem. Another problem that clinicians uh, have is that dealing with people uh, requires that they disclose what's going on with them. And that can be a problem because people are not always aware of the issues that they're having, or they may be aware but be facing things like stigma. Think about an active duty soldier or somebody in law enforcement or a parent who's facing a custody case, right? There are reasons that people don't disclose or are unable to disclose. And even if they are aware and want to seek help, more than a third of the people in this country live in federally designated areas where there are shortages of mental health providers. More than a third, 124 plus million people, will have a hard time finding somebody if they know even that they need to find somebody. And last, the traditional methods are often not working well. So a very important paper a couple of years ago analyzed the literature and found that over 50 years, the ability to predict suicidal thoughts and behaviors had not improved at all. What area of medicine can we talk about that has not had an improvement in 50 years? Now, there are some signs that technology can help. This is uh, from one of my favorite papers by Glenn Coppersmith on NLP as a screening for suicide risk. And he used a data set of Twitter posts that were contributed by families of people who had died by suicide or suicide attempt survivors or people who simply wanted to donate their data. And they were able to use machine learning techniques to identify whether somebody in that data set had made or was going to make, based on the information they had, a suicide attempt with 90 to 95% true positives and only 10 to 20% false positives. That's impressive. This points out the value of getting into the clinical white space. The little red marks there are healthcare encounters for a real person over a period of four years. The blue marks are their social media posts. You can get a lot of information about what's going on with people, and you need to outside of the healthcare system. Now, um, a problem that I've discovered as a technologist talking to suicidologists and suicide prevention experts is, then what? I mean, suppose you had this technology scaled up and for a broader population. What do you do then in a scenario, in a country where the mental health care system is already dramatically overburdened? And the thing that needs to be pointed out, and this is, the, if you take away one thing, this is the most important slide of the talk, is that technology is not the solution. The engagement of the people who understand the problem with the technologists is the solution. You need people who understand what is needed, and as technologists, we in this room, are people who understand what is possible that they may not have even imagined. So uh, the rest of the talk is going to be about talking about what's possible, matching needs with solutions. I'm going to say a word about data, but there's an entire talk I can give that uh, Rebecca refers to as my data rant. Um, I will give you the sort of one sentence version of it, which is that healthcare and mental health care approaches in natural language processing, processing and AI in this country are a solid 10 years behind the state of the art in other domains because the data are sensitive and fear in organizations of what will be done with their data and individuals makes data less accessible. And therefore, there is no image net for mental health to revolutionize and advance the field. Right? Um, now, one thing that I have worked on to try to address that problem 
is trying to reverse the process, and instead of working on disseminating data out to researchers, you bring the researchers to the data inside a secure data enclave where they have access to the data and the full arsenal of machine learning tools, but the data can't get out. No SFTP, no opening a socket, no copy and paste from the virtual desktop they're working on. So I actually worked with uh, Nork at the University of Chicago, a nonprofit, and we ran a couple of challenge competitions with sensitive mental health data. I will point out that Nork, uh, their healthcare enclave is backed on AWS. Um, and this is a proof of concept kind of approach that we've done a number of times to basically prove out this idea that it is possible to safely acquire and govern in an ethical way and then work on sensitive mental health data um, and I believe that's going to be the solution to the problem. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on two things. The first is the idea that we need to recognize that the system is incredibly resource constrained and therefore we simply cannot use the typical supervised learning approaches and end things there. So typical supervised learning, you have you know, inputs that come in, you have labels that come out, right? But the labels right, are not enough for the clinician. Why was this person being flagged as being at risk or as having a particular mental health condition? Right? They need to have more visibility into what's going on with people. And let's suppose that the labels were perfectly good and there were no false positives. Just the true positives, if we did a better job of identifying them, would further overwhelm the system. So we do not have a classification problem, right? Or even a scalar risk level problem. What we have is a prioritization problem. So I want to talk a little bit about some work that a student of mine, Han Chen Xing, did in his dissertation. He's actually now working at Amazon Comprehend Medical. Um, what he did was use an architecture called a hierarchical attention network, um, basically a feed-forward network, but with attention in between the layers, going from words to sentences, sentences to documents, and then all of the individual's documents feeding into classification of some kind at the top. This is important for two reasons. One is that in the healthcare system, you don't have information about documents. What you have is information about individuals. So the supervision cannot happen at the level of individual documents unless you're going to go through some enormous annotation effort, right? So you need something where you can provide the feedback, the credit assignment, when you're doing your back propagation through the network, so you are actually using the signal at the level of the individual to get the information that you need at the level of the documents and the sentences and the words. In addition, this provides a way of assigning attention or weight to the specific information at each level. And what that allows you to do is not only to rank the individuals, right? But within an individual level ranking, to rank the documents that were most responsible for the label that was assigned to them. So this is real social media data obfuscated for privacy um, in a simulated study where we looked at ranking people on suicide risk. And what you can see here is that you're ranking the individuals, and then it's bubbling up to the top the posts and then using the red highlighting to identify words or phrases within the post that are the things that the clinician should be paying attention to as why the system made the prediction that it did. Now, in this last part, I want to talk about lived experiences. As a technologist, when I look at the clinical white space, I look at the fact that people are posting on social media, that we have access to these things, and, and, and people are often willing, for the right reasons, to opt in to access to these things, right? My reaction is this is amazing. We can get a very, very rich picture of people's experiences outside the clinical setting. Rebecca's response is, well, yeah, every lived experience is an N of one. Right? Each person is unique and an individual, and that's very important. But at the same time, if you want to do good science, you have to find ways of looking at populations of people, of getting n greater than 1 in order to figure out what works and what generalizes. So one way to do this is to start with theory. Right? Start with what the domain experts tell us is important, and then look for it in the data. So, for example, Dr. Igor Gallinger at Beth Israel Mount Sinai has developed something called suicide crisis syndrome as a diagnostic characterization of suicidal crisis. One of the factors in that is called entrapment or frantic hopelessness, right? So simply being depressed is not itself the thing that 
tells you that somebody is having suicidal crisis. Many depressed people can't get out of bed in the morning, much less make a plan to kill themselves, right? But it's the combination of the depression with a frantic sense that there is no way out, right? The energy combined with the problem of mood, right? And we can look for signals of that top down. We know what to look for in people's text, for example. There's a different approach that we've been exploring, which is to work bottom up. So I've been using a category of model called a topic model. Um, if you go ahead and look for it, LDA, or latent Dirichlet allocation, is a very widely used way to bring information from raw text into interpretable categories. If you've seen a factor analysis or a principal components analysis, a PCA, then you've seen this kind of thing before. You have a bunch of items uh, going down the left-hand side, lots and lots of features, highly dimensional space, and what you're doing is squishing that high number of features down into a lower set of latent categories, and those categories contain the generalizations that you're after. Right? So what LDA does intuitively is the same thing as a PCA, not the actual mechanics of it, but intuitively what it's giving you is a set of latent categories that we call topics. And each topic is a probability distribution over the vocabulary. So for example, here you see topic 11, right? a latent category that was discovered. And high probability words associated with that topic are things like school and parents and college. We can immediately look at that and say, oh, OK, this is a category latent in whatever the body of text is that we analyzed that is considering talking about education, similarly for drug use there. The other thing that you get is just like in a PCA or a factor analysis, when you get a loading on each item of the latent category, Right? So you have a weight or a loading for each item for each of the latent variables that you've got. LDA does exactly the same thing. And so if you take a single category, like here, topic number 11, and sort all of the documents that you analyzed in the collection, looking at the ones that are high, highly loaded, or have a high probability on that category in the model, what you're going to see, hopefully, is what you expect to see here. Here's people talking about schools and education. So this is a bottom-up way. Notice there was no top-down information given to this thing. It's a Bayesian model, but there are no informative priors going on here, right? So it's, it's bottom-up in the same way intuitively as a PCA or a factor analysis. We did a study a couple of years back, well, a number of years back now, where we looked at essays written by college students about their experiences coming to college. Um, this is data collected by Jamie Pennebaker um, in psychology at University of, um, of Texas at Austin. Um, and we looked at the categories that came out. Each of those rows there are the high probability words in order. And we looked at how they related to scores for neuroticism on the Big Five personality inventory. And we did that because neuroticism is very often comorbid with depression. Right? So we figured we'll look at neuroticism, we've got big five, and we can actually get a sense of which categories that we discover in students writing about their experiences are related to this variable of neuroticism. And what you see is that um, if things are not associated with neuroticism, you get things like it's masked out there, but game, play, football, et cetera, are high probability words. So like sports, right? listening to music, going to parties. right? are the kinds of things that people are writing about when they score low for neuroticism. For people who score higher for neuroticism, you're seeing people talk about somatic symptoms. My head hurts, itches, right? My eyes are bothering me. Which, by the way, is how people present to their primary care providers often when they're suffering depression, right? They don't come in saying, I'm depressed. They're coming in saying, I've got headaches. I'm having trouble sleeping, right? Um, and the other thing that I want to emphasize about this is that when you look at the categories, categories that come out, bottom up from this population and their texts, it's specific to the population. So if you had a population of like, new moms who were at risk for postpartum depression, they would not be talking about their exhaustion in terms of being late for class. Right? If you had a bunch of veterans, they would not be talking about the anxiety that they're expressing in terms of worrying about being nervous about a test. So this provides a way of learning bottom up from bodies of text Right? What's going on in the lived experiences of a population? Now, we did this again with a very interesting natural experiment that took place. Most suicide research focuses on why people die. There is important research on why people 
don't die, reasons to live, but it is less studied. Now, back in 2020, somebody posted on Reddit, at the Ask Me Anything subreddit, basically asking people, hey, if you've been suicidal, tell me what you got through the dark times. And there were over 16,000 responses to that in about a day. But that's the top level responses. That's not even comments on the responses, right? A very wide range of lived experiences. So we did the process I just described with the topic modeling. But that by itself is not enough. Because look, if you do machine learning and AI stuff, you know that a lot of the time what a system produces is going to be crap, right? So you need humans in the loop to curate the results of what's being discovered in this process. So one of the things that I've been working on is a systematic protocol, a process for expert curation of what comes out of these models. So in this data set, one of the categories that comes out is people talking about mother, sister, mom, dad. They're talking about family members, right? And when you sort by the loading right, on that particular category, you find people talking about the impact on their families as one of the reasons that they ended up not dying by suicide. Right? That, as I said, is not enough. What you want to do is have two independent subject matter experts read through these categories and the top-ranked documents. If you've ever done content analysis, any social scientists here, right? this is basically developing a coding frame, but guided by the topic model as opposed to just starting from scratch and reading all the documents. Right? Then you take what was done independently, because triangulation gives you confidence that it's real, and you achieve a consensus of what the name should be for this category and what the description of this category should be. And then you have clinicians, right, who look at these categories, and suicide researchers and experts, and say, what have we learned from this? I want to tell you a little bit about things that we've learned from this, right? So there were when we organized the data after this curation process for, we'll call them meta-categories, so we group these latent categories into groups. One we call caretaking, so you see this not wanting to hurt specific family members that showed up before in here, right? Um, you have financial burdens on people was a distinct category that showed up, right? So there are things that have a lot of face validity, right? Things that we already knew are things that people worry about that might, in fact, stop them from killing themselves. What's really interesting um, is stuff that we might not have known. Now, a lot of people, you, you won't find in the research literature a lot of discussion of people's cats and dogs, but this is a very important topic. People's pets are one of the reasons they don't kill themselves. They're worried about what are going to happen to their pets. Right? So I would conjecture that if you did a randomized controlled trial where somebody who is in suicidal crisis who has a pet, you tell them, Take a picture of your pet, put it on your nightstand, and make it the last thing you look at at night before you go to bed, and the first thing you look at when you wake up in the morning. A simple intervention like that, I conjecture, would actually help in preventing suicide. It's just a conjecture. It's the kind of thing where you actually need to do the research. But we know that caring contacts actually help. Right? A text message, a postcard, there is literature showing that just the reaching out is an intervention. I'm not talking about drugs. I'm not talking about ketamine. Right? I'm talking about a postcard. I'm talking about a simple intervention. What can we learn about people's experiences that can guide us to effective interventions? Another thing that turned out to be, I mean, you, you can see some of the quotes of stuff that, that, that's written up here. Some of them are, 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 are quite honestly pretty wild. Um, uh, one of them, so this is uh, thinking ahead to things positively. We have a category that, for the moment, we're calling simple pleasures. This was one that's really surprising and not something um, that uh, the clinicians were like expecting. Why do some people decide not to kill themselves? They want to see how Game of Thrones turned out. They want to see the next version of the, their game drop. They want to see what Taylor Swift's next album is going to look like, right? And it's really important to discover this from what's going on with people because I can tell you what Rebecca has said as a clinician is if you're in a conversation with somebody and you're like, you're thinking of killing yourself, what is there to keep you alive? And they say, I want to see the next you know, um, uh, uh, Marvel Comics movie. Like, wait, what? We're talking about life and death and you're talking about like movies? It can create a kind of a distancing, right? If clinicians are aware that there are unexpected lifelines that exist in people's lived experiences, then they can actually work with people more effectively. Right? Um, another one that was pretty wild, actually, is spite. A reason people often don't kill themselves is because they want to show somebody that they're actually going to stay alive. Right? That's another interesting kind of category that emerged. So these are Rebecca's slides. 
right? She points out that in terms of clinical implications, it's really important for clinicians to find the lifelines, not to dismiss these things. And by looking at a range of people's experiences, we can discover what some of these things are that you're going to see. In addition, there is this notion of cathexis, which is sort of where you put your emotional uh, and intellectual energy. You want to find what are the things that matter to people, which can be unexpected. Could be the next drop of their video game, and channel their energy toward that. Sometimes things that we think are damaging, like drug use, are actually a lifeline for people getting over a crisis. She points out, and this is her direct quote, you don't teach people to swim while they're drowning. Right? Sometimes you actually have to go with what is working, let them have the lifeline. And so there's a lot of implications of this, some pop, you know, maybe, maybe problematic, but we need to look at it. So again, I'm just flashing this takeaway slide up again because you have to look at the technology in the context of the broader ecosystem, not throwing technology at a problem. Um, a colleague of mine that I've worked with, April Foreman at the Veterans Administration, points out that people have come to her with apps all the time or, or technology saying, we think that this can help, who have never spoken to a suicidologist. Don't be one of those. Right? Be one of the technologists who actually talks about what's possible with people who understand what's needed. I want to point out that the technique I'm describing here is useful for lots of other things. So we've also done work with open-ended survey responses, you know, not multiple choice, but people like write out text. And so, for example, in a nationally representative COVID-19 impact survey, I've worked with colleagues on figuring out various kinds of concerns or impacts that they've had. Any body of text, right? If it's sufficient in size and character, is something you can try applying these kinds of techniques to, but I encourage you not to stop with the technology, but go through something that looks like this curation process with domain experts. So takeaways, language has enormously valuable symbols. We need to get our hands on it and enable researchers to use it. And I think the way we do this is within secure enclaves. Right? We need prioritization, not just labeling or classification, and the technology is not enough. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Resnick. Such an interesting subject. Um, and now, please allow me to introduce Professor John Tamir. Thank you, Nina. Uh, thanks all for, for your attendance, and thank you to Amazon Research Awards for the support and the opportunity to talk today. Uh, really great presentation by Philip. Uh, I'm going to talk about another sector of healthcare where we can use machine learning to uh, try to improve outcomes. I'll talk about how we can use uh, deep learning for robust magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, so a couple of the topics for today. First, I'll go over what MRI or magnetic resonance imaging is in the context of imagery construction, and then I'll talk about how we can use deep learning to speed it up. Uh, I'll mostly be focusing on two of our recent papers, one in NeurIPS last year and uh, one that uh, currently on archive on motion correction. Um, many of you have probably heard about MRI, but you probably think of a single 2D brain scan. But I want to really emphasize that medical imaging today is super advanced, highly dimensional. What we're looking at here is an MRI scan of a one-year-old baby um, with a video that's playing is, is representing the, the blood flow over time. And so with this type of comprehensive exam, we can look at both function of the heart as well as um, various types of anatomical structure. And we can do this all while the baby is freely breathing um, without any kind of intervention. So what's missing from MRI? Well, there's still a number of open challenges. First of all, uh, fast imaging. MRI scans are very slow. If you've ever had an MRI scan, you've probably been in the scanner for about an hour. And uh, MRI, although is safe, it's non-ionizing radiation, meaning non-cancer-causing radiation, we often still require anesthesia for kids because of motion. And anesthesia and sedation in kids is actually quite dangerous. Uh, and also, MRI is not the most affordable. Uh, it's, it's very expensive uh, machinery, and it's quite inaccessible because of the scan times. And so we want to try to um, uh, solve some of these issues. Um, so the focus of, of my work is on what I call computational MRI. It's the idea of 
jointly designing how the data are collected, how it's post-processed into reconstruction, and then further analyzed downstream. But for the most part, I'll focus on the left side of this, which is really about how we acquire the data and how we reconstruct it into high-quality images with limited data. And we'll save the analysis for all of your awesome um, discoveries. Um, so a little bit about MRI. How is the data collected? The signal that you get from the scanner is not the raw image, but it's actually what's called the Fourier transform of the image. We can think of this like the measurements Y that we collect represents some image X that goes through the system, possibly with noise. And what this looks like pictorially is that we have an image in the scanner. We have an object in the scanner. It goes into the Fourier domain, which we call case space, and then we make little measurements, these red dots. Each one is one measurement, and each dot takes time to collect. Um, unlike other computer vision tasks, MRI is complex valued in nature. That means that there's both a real, a real component and an imaginary component, or similarly, a magnitude and a phase. And many of the systems designed for uh, deep learning-based imaging don't really appreciate this nuance in the type of data that we collect. Now, as we collect the measurements, we get a better and better image. And every measurement that we collect on the left informs globally on the image on the right. And so we just have to collect enough data on the left before we can reconstruct the image using conventional methods. Now, if we collect less data, then we will scan faster. If we collect less data, we won't have to spend as much time in the MRI scanner. But there's also a drawback to that. So if we collect fewer of these red dots, we'll get an image faster, but the image will have artifacts. The type of artifacts that we get are actually deeply coupled to which measurements we collect which makes MRI awesome. It means that we can actually design optimal scanning patterns in order to get the best type of corrupted image that we can then correct with advanced methods like deep learning. And so this is all posed as what's called an inverse problem. We can think of the image reconstruction as going from image to data to case space and then coming up with a method that reproduces the image as if we had collected all of the data in the first place. So maybe this is a one-third of the scan time, but we want to create an image that represents the full scan time. And this is difficult because it's ill-posed, meaning we don't have enough measurements to fully determine what the image is. And so we want to incorporate prior knowledge. And this is really where deep learning shines in the context of image reconstruction. We can use deep learning in various ways, possibly as a black box, uh, but we'll really use it in an algorithmic fashion to recover the image from the me uh, missing measurements. And there's kind of two approaches, end-to-end -end supervised training and generative modeling. Now, end-to-end -end supervised training, I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Uh, in this case, we're not going from an image to a label, but we're going from an undersampled signal space to an image. So it's a regression problem. But we can still handle it with deep learning. So we can design, for instance, a convolutional neural network. It will take in as input the data, as well as the measurement model. We know what, how we're scanning. And it will recover and reconstruct an image that can then be compared to a ground truth. And this is by far state of the art in the MRI domain. Um, what this looks like, though, is we take it a step further. And instead of just applying a black box deep network, we actually think of this as an iterative reconstruction algorithm inspired by the inverse problem literature. So what this means is that we actually take our data and we iteratively update the image by going through what's called the data consistency step. Let's make sure that the image that we deliver is consistent with the small number of measurements we've actually collected. And then let's regularize that using advanced prior knowledge through deep networks. And we'll repeat this a bunch of times. We'll do this iteratively. So if we open this up, we can call this an unrolled reconstruction algorithm, where we're iteratively processing through a data consistency step, which itself could be an iterative algorithm, followed by passing it through an autoencoder auto type CNN that removes all of the artifacts in the image. And we iteratively refine this so that the final result we get is consistent with the measurements and has high quality. 
so here's just some pseudocode to show what this looks like. And as I do, in this case, nine unrolls, so I'm iteratively updating the image nine times through my CNN, you can see that I effectively I just have these two blocks. One is a deep net, for instance, a UNet or a ResNet autoencoder, and a data consistency block. And I just go one after the other until I've done enough unrolls. And if you uh, know anything about auto differentiation, you can probably appreciate that this creates quite large computational graphs because we're actually iteratively going through the CNN multiple times, which we then update the weights of compared to the ground truth. So end-to-end uh, -end supervised training is state of the art. Facebook AI and uh, NYU uh, ran a public challenge for MRI reconstruction a couple years ago. And all, by far, all of the methods in this challenge board, this is just from top to bottom, are all deep learning supervised training based. And if I scroll all the way to the bottom, I finally get to the original classical methods that people were using before deep learning really took, uh, took a, a, a step in, into the medical imaging domain. So what's the problem? Well, there's a number of drawbacks to end-to-end -end supervised training. First of all, the deep network and training is coupled to the measurement process. This might seem like a good thing, but if the measurements change, do we need to retrain our model? How do we, how do we account for that? Uh, also, when dealing in the healthcare realm, uh, uncertainty is really important to, to understand, and estimating uncertainty can be challenging with these supervised networks. Uh, and then another topic that I won't talk about right now is about how these reconstructions get highly overtuned to specific anatomy and contrast. Think of this as generalization error. So the first drawback, that the deep networks are coupled to the measurement process. So what I'm showing here on the left is the acquisition pattern in the data space. So these, these white lines are what we've collected, and the black lines are measurements that we didn't collect, so it's a faster scan. And on the right is the reconstruction, which is considered state of the art in our field. But if the sampling pattern changes, if instead of sampling in the vertical direction, we sample in the horizontal direction, well, this specific network was not designed to see this kind of sampling change, and the performance degrades. We can see that there's these artifacts highlighted by the orange arrows. And in a, in a hospital environment, we cannot exactly control what the sampling pattern will be every time, because every time we scan a new subject, the imaging anatomy is slightly different, the imaging plane is slightly different, and we'll get a different measurement pattern as well. Um, we've done some work on correcting motion in MRI. I'll show that in a little bit as well. And deep learning works really well at removing motion artifacts. So this image in the middle is a motion corrupt scan. The subject was moving during the scan, and deep learning can correct that. But once again, if the measurement pattern changes, or if the motion behavior changes, then my pre-trained network will not work in this situation. And I cannot anticipate every possible type of motion pattern combined with sampling pattern in order to train this network. And as I mentioned, estimating uncertainty is also challenging. Um, in supervised methods, it typically requires a specialized architecture, retraining, or possibly both to draw many samples. What we'd really like is not only a reconstruction, but also an uncertainty map that tells us how correct is our reconstruction. Can we rely on this result? So let's go back to the basics and look at the image reconstruction problem from a statistical uh, lens. Our goal is really to estimate the image, x, from the noisy measurements, y. Now, maximum likelihood would tell us to maximize the probability of a specific outcome given the parameter meaning we want to find the image that best fits the measurements. This is a data consistency type uh, statement. But we also know that the images we get from the scanner have a lot of uh, specific structure in them, right? We're not imaging pictures of cats. We're imaging brains, or we're imaging cardiac function. So we want to incorporate the prior knowledge of our imagery that we're scanning into the algorithm. If we can do that, we can combine the two and form this under a more Bayesian lens and calculate the posterior distribution. As opposed to which image best fits the measurements, let's find um, which image is most consistent with the measurements and our prior knowledge of what images look like. And this takes us to generative modeling, second approach to image reconstruction with deep learning. And I will argue that this is a, 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 an approach that has a little bit more ground to stand on. We want to use deep networks not to completely replace the reconstruction, but just to learn the prior distribution. And so what I'm showing here are images of brains that don't exist. These are all trained with our generative model. 
to effectively sample from the prior distribution, P of x. And the idea with this is that we will explicitly decouple the statistical image prior from the measurement model. We don't want these to be combined. We'll just use deep learning to learn the best prior of what images should look like, and then we'll use our knowledge of the MRI forward model, the physics, to fill in the missing gaps. Now, generative models are powerful image generators. That's why we're really interested in using them, and they've been demonstrated, especially in the last few years, uh, just unprecedented quality at generating images. Um, so these are all generative models trained on various data sets um, in order to get images from the same distribution that don't actually, um, were not existing in the training set. Uh, another example, this cat does not exist.com. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but every time you click refresh, you'll get another cat that doesn't exist. It's a generative model trained to create new cats. Okay, so should we use the cat generative model for our MRI reconstruction? Probably not, but we can use the same idea. But before that, let's look a little bit at another complication, which is that all of this literature, this exciting uh, advances in generative modeling are really considering what I would call the benchmark linear inverse problem. They consider an RGB image, let's say, of uh, Obama. Every pixel is non-negative from 0 to 255, and it goes through what's called a random Gaussian measurement process to give us limited measurements. But that's not the situation in MRI. In MRI, we have complex value data, first of all. It's not RGB. Secondly, something I didn't talk about is that actually we collect measurements from multiple sensors spread around the object. So if you've ever had a brain scan, you probably were fitted into a helmet with multiple coils. And then those go through a continuous Fourier transform. So it's another complication that this is a continuous to continuous um, transform as opposed to discrete to discrete like the top shows. And then finally we get our measurements. And our measurements are not random Gaussian, but they're random samples from the Fourier space. And there's an additional complication that we actually have to choose in what order we collect them. And so that's something I didn't talk about at all. You can imagine the type of policies you might create on what ordering of what samples to collect in order to get the most juice out of your limited scan time budget. Um, another complication is what is at stake, right? So this is uh, from a colleague of mine, uh, Yanis Daris. Uh, their reconstruction on the right, the reference on the left. So this is reconstructing an image of Obama from limited measurements, and they claim superior visual reconstructions. Looks really great. Um, but you might notice some differences, right? The hair is, is quite smoothed out. Uh, there's fewer freckles. It's not quite the same picture. Here's an example from the Fast MRI Challenge. This is one of the leader, uh, one of the winners of the competition. The left is the reference. The right is the reconstruction. And it looks really good, but the radiologist mentioned that this generated a false vessel, possibly related to susceptibility artifacts introduced by the surgical staples. OK, so we don't want to recreate reconstruct vessels that don't exist. We need to know if these are part of the original data or not, or at least have some met metric of, of uncertainty. And so our work is really using these deep generative priors in a what we would call a robust way. So that includes both the empirical analysis, but it also includes theoretical evidence for why sampling from this posterior distribution is the correct thing to do. And we show that it is competitive with these end-to-end -end supervised methods when the training and testing conditions match. But it's robust when the sampling changes, when the anatomy changes. And this is because we explicitly decouple the deep learning from the iterative optimization that uses the MRI model. And we can also use this to get uncertainty. So uh, in a nutshell, maybe some of you have heard about score-based generative models. But they're very different than conventional uh, generative adversarial networks. What they do is they take in an image as an input, and the output is a special object the same size as the image that represents the gradient of the log of the probability of that image. Essentially what that means is that if we put an image into our deep network, the thing that comes out will be a notion of which direction to move, how to update that image, in order to move to a more probable MR image. So we have the low density region of images with artifacts, and we have the high density region of good looking images. Um, now this has been used in a method called annealed Langevin dynamics to sample from the prior. So each of these grids of images is a new sample generated from the training set distribution, but they're all new images, right? So each image is one sample. The architecture here is what's called an NCSN v2. It's uh, similar to a UNET. And each of these images is generated with a process that adds, starts with a noisy input and gradually removes the noise by moving to a higher probability region with some annealing as well. 
So we're going to use this method to do what we call posterior sampling. We will run a Neil Longevin dynamics, but instead of sampling from the prior P of X, we will sample from the posterior P of X given Y. This means we will find the images most consistent with the measurements under this prior. And what this would look like is that we would start with our noise input, and we would successively remove the noise by moving to the higher density region of this posterior until we get a reconstruction. But we can run this multiple times. We can run it with another noise instance and draw another sample from the posterior. And so we can build not just a point estimate, but actually a distribution of reconstructions. And the pseudocode, again, is quite simple. And the reconstruction is shown here on the right. Once again, I just have two specific blocks. I have my score net, which this time is again a CNN, but it was trained to predict the log probability gradient, so what direction to move. And once again, I have a data consistency block that makes sure that the measurements I get are consistent. But this Anil Longevin Dynamics algorithm, which also injects noise, is designed to sample from the posterior. Of course, we will have some error because our score network is not exactly giving us the score function, but it will be close to the correct thing, right? And so you can see here how the image magically appears out of the noise, right? But it's not quite magic. It's using knowledge of the MRI system and this prior distribution that we pre-trained. OK, so why is this good? Well, we ran some experiments on this, comparing it to end-to-end -end supervised learning in this um, fast MRI challenge data set. And we looked specifically at data shifts. What happens if the measurement model changes a little bit? What happens if the scan anatomy changes? Uh, we want to understand that, because that's how these systems would actually be deployed in practice. Um, what this is showing right here is kind of summarizing all of the quantitative results in one plot for in-distribution training. What you can see is the blue curve, which is ours. The x-axis is the scan time speed up. So 2x means twice as fast. 12 means 12 times faster. And these baseline methods are all various methods, either doing end-to-end -end supervised learning or classical reconstructions. And they all work about the same at low acceleration factors. But as you increase the acceleration factor, the speed up, you can see that these start to degrade because they weren't intended to be used at those accelerations. Whereas ours has a slower degradation because it was not trained explicitly with a measurement model. And this is, is amplified when we also look at measurement and data shifts. If we change how the data are collected, that's the top right plot, then all of the others drop down in performance. But ours is actually the same performance because it was not trained for that specific sampling pattern. And if we look at various sampling, for instance, if we image the abdomen, body imaging, versus brain imaging or knee imaging, we see a similar type of hierarchy of methods where essentially we attain the, retain the performance. Um, these are some qualitative results that show reconstructions on the test set. To orient you, the left is the ground truth. The middle two are competing baselines, compressed sensing, and a variational network, which is an end-to-end -end method, and then ours on the very right. And what you can see is that this high 10x faster scan, our image is faithfully representing the ground truth, while the others uh, present artifacts because they were not intended to be used at this acceleration factor. We can also apply this to knee imaging, so we can use it out of, di out of distribution. And the reason we can do this is motivated by our theoretical results. And once again, this is a knee image. And what the, what the radiologist cares about is really just the strip of the knee in the middle. Nothing else is really that important to them. And so again, we can see that. Um, but we can also get uncertainty out of this. So we can run our reconstruction algorithm multiple times to sample from the posterior distribution. And we can produce what's called the minimum mean square error estimate. And what I'm showing here is the ground truth on the left. And that red arrow is pointing to the pathology. That's what the radiologist is looking for. And you can see our reconstruction on the right. But we can also look at the standard deviation of our results. That's one way of uh, uh, one notion of uncertainty. And that uh, tracks the ground truth as well. And so just summarizing this idea, we can do MRI reconstruction with score-based models. We can get samples from the posterior. We can run multiple samples to get an average reconstruction. And then we can also characterize uncertainty of our result, which closely tracks the true error of the reconstruction. We've also run this at UT Austin in the Dell Medical School on new subjects to show that this can actually work in a clinical environment. So we ran the multiple sclerosis protocol. These are all healthy volunteers, um, but just showing again that we can actually produce algorithms from a new hospital with a different scanning protocol using these generative models without retraining. That's the key takeaway there. 
And finally, I'll just mention that we've also extended this to adapting to motion. We can model motion during the scan as essentially changing what measurements we collect. In this case, we're just um, treating rigid motion, meaning rotation and translation in 2D. But because our prior is on the image and not on the measurement model, we don't need to retrain our method. We just use the same generative model pre-trained on clean X images. This is what the reconstruction would look like if we don't account for motion. And so this just, just to emphasize that it is important to account for motion in the scan, or else we'll have to recollect the data. And we just use the same method, but now we jointly solve for both the image and the motion, which is unknown at reconstruction time. And once again, we go through this annealing process of starting with noise and ending with a clean image plus motion estimation. And so what this looks like on a test example, the ground truth is on the left, and now our reconstruction is both the image and the motion patterns that are happening during the acquisition. So the x-axis here is what acquisition number we're collecting. In this case, we're getting about nine acquisitions for a, for a 4x uh, image. And we can see that essentially the error tracks up to an offset, which is because of rigid motion. Right? We can always rotate and get the same solution. And so we're actually not just recovering the unknown image, but also the motion. So uh, with that, I'd like to conclude with a few of the takeaways. Um, I think robustness to test time distribution is really the major hurdle in deploying these deep learning methods for MRI reconstruction. And decoupling the image prior from the measurement model can help in that endeavor. Posterior sampling is really attractive, not just because of the experimental results, but also the robustness guarantees that we get. And uh, accounting for this measurement process is the critical piece. Uh, but of course, clinical validation is still needed before deploying these types of methods. And if you're interested, all of our code is available online. Uh, with that, I would like to thank the team, the Computational Sensing and Imaging Lab, as well as my collaborators at UT Austin and uh, Grant Support. So thank you very much.